Good afternoon, and thank you, Alexandra, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to just mumble on for a few minutes to everyone sits down. And I will tell you that the afternoon speaker has this wonderful time slot because uh, we as adults still have an EEG pattern, a brain pattern going on in the afternoon at about three o'clock like a baby does when they're taking their nap. So if you remember, those of you who are parents, the last nap that a child goes through or uh, gets rid of is the afternoon nap. But then I will tell you that you are disadvantaged, not me, because I am jet lagged and I am really talking in the morning. Okay? So, uh, and the first thing I want to say is many of you have read some of my papers and I want to tell you that my talks are certainly much easier to follow than how I write, okay? So don't be overly uh, concerned that you won't track it. My talks tend to be a type of experiential talk that is very much uh, informed by the concepts that were discussed in the previous talk by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Galezi. And that is that when we see certain types of behaviors and features, our bodies automatically respond that way. And this, to me, I don't call it mirror neurons. I use the term neuroception, which is our bodies responding without a sense of awareness to cues in the environment. And as we go through this talk, you'll start understanding what I mean. I also uh, actually have a title change because I think the theme of what we're all talking about, especially this morning, is the concept of connectedness. How two human beings, or more than two human beings, have the ability to co-regulate their bodily and physiological state. And this being a primary agenda in the mammalian experience. And the effect that what trauma does, it disrupts that ability of two individuals to co-regulate because the person who is trying to calm the person is now perceived or detected by the other individual as being a threat. So we're going to talk about this whole concept of connectedness, and that is how human beings and other mammals are linked to each other as a survival uh, response or as an adaptation to their survival. So in a sense, the whole theme of the talk can be our body needs to engage and bond with another human being or I often say appropriate mammal, because some people do better with a dog or a cat. Now, we're going to look at a variety, several pictures, and in these pictures, I want you to focus on the upper part of the face. There is a muscle called the obicularis oculi, which is the orbital muscle around the eye. That orbital muscle is bilaterally innervated. It's extremely important in our survival. And as we look at these pictures, even when we look at other mammals, what do we look at? We actually look at the upper part of the face and the eyes. So looking at this picture, which is a picture of monk seals. Uh, these are seals that I took the picture with my iPhone on the beaches of Kauai, Hawaii. So I invite you all to go there and see this endangered species. <laughs> you won't have to reach under your chair for that, that trip, but you can visualize it. But what you see when you look at this picture, it should be very comforting to you. And that is, again, by looking at the upper part of the face of these aquatic mammals, we see features of contentment and comfort and comforting of co-regulation. We see the same type of engagement as we look at other couples. And we again see the orientation the proximity and the comforting of individuals looking at each other. So connectedness is a biological imperative. What that means is that this is the natural state of a mammal. Connectedness is the ability to mutually, and then I elaborate on that and I say that it should be synchronous, symbiotic, meaning that it benefits both, and reciprocal, 
Now, the issue of synchronicity is important because today we're doing so much of our social interaction through asynchronous methods like the internet. And we lack the same resource of regulating each other when we go asynchronous. But the connectedness is an ability to mutually regulate our physiological and behavioral states. So what's obvious to most is that it, there's a re regulation of behavior. But what you'll start to understand is that the behavior is an emergent property that is superimposed on the underlying physiological state. And so the manipulation through interaction with another changes the physiological state to facilitate social behavior and co-regulation. Connectedness provides the neurobiological mechanism to link social behavior with both mental and physical health. So when people can no longer connect, can no longer co-regulate with another, they are not only suffering mental health dysfunction, they also suffer from vulnerabilities for physical illnesses. So we can again start looking at these pictures of connectedness. And the f earlier picture showed face to face, but what we also will see is that over time, when people become safe with each other, they no longer have to look directly at each other, but their bodies can conform. Many of you work with children or with infants, and many of you have been parents. And you know that when you hold the baby, if the baby conforms to your body, when you hold the baby, it's comforting to you and comforting to the child. This conforming tells you something about the co-regulation of the individuals. So this idea of conforming is critical in understanding our, pla our uh, proximity with another. This is so important that it becomes an icon. It's a visualization that can be used in love or Valentine's Day cards to, in a sense, be symbolic of people who love each other. So the conforming of one body with another is an iconic representation of feeling safe with another and being able to co-regulate your physiological state with another. Now, the important part and the total theme of this talk is that our physiological state influences the range of behavior and influences the human experience. So the human experience, the range of behavior, and the psychological features that we see the world are greatly influenced by our physiological state. Such so that when we have something like a trauma, it can create an acute disconnectedness. It can disrupt our physiological state. Now we can see that when we look at people who are asynchronously communicating, the visceral response that you have looking at this picture is far from soothing and calming. You do not see proximity, you don't see engagement, you don't see the bodies conforming. But you see that these people are doing something that today is called social networking or social communication or something like that, where they have co-opted the important word of social and place it in a platform that is more comfortable for people who without social uh, skills or sensitivities to perform. When we look at a picture like this, even though they're proximal, we see that the orientation of the head makes us feel not so comfortable. It's as if there are two people that are physically close to each other, but not psychologically communicating. And when we see this, we see that this couple, from our perspective, just looking at this picture, is not really co-regulating. Uh, I'll give you another moment to perceive this one. Uh, and what I, okay, so what's being, uh, there are web, page net, web pages now that say that something like 25% of